Great. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on uh, a Friday evening. And uh, we're just going to wait a few minutes, uh, just wait a few seconds for people to log in and for the internet to do its work connecting audio and things like that. So just give us a second. All right, uh, great. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Akshay Rajkumar. I'm, I'm uh, I lead a church called Redeemer in New Delhi, and I'm very excited to have with us uh, Jay Stringer. Uh, Jay Stringer is the author of this book, uh, Unwanted, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing. And uh, it's, it's just a really powerful book, and I thought it's such a great uh, subject for us to be talking about, particularly in a pandemic where uh, things like this can get exasperated, I mean, uh, exaggerated and uh, become more uh, more of a coping mechanism. So, uh, Jay, thank you for being with us uh, this, this evening, morning, your time. Uh, let me just briefly introduce Jay. Jay is a licensed mental health counselor and ordained minister. Uh, he lives uh, in the U.S. Uh, with his wife and two children. And uh, yeah, so I'm just, I won't waste too much time. Uh, in an introduction, but uh, it's a great book, and I want you to. Uh, I will talk talk to you a little bit more about how you can get it later on, and also about some resources that are available on Jay's website uh, regarding his uh, work. So, Jay, thank you for being with us. It's uh, great to have you with us uh, this evening. I'll, I'll walk us through our flow for the evening. I've got a few questions for Jay that'll just uh, help uh, help us get a sense of what the book is about. And uh, after that, we'll have a time of question and answer from you. So if you've got any questions, you can uh, just keep them in mind. And anytime you want to ask a question, just post it in the Q&A option on your webinar, and uh, we'll get to them later on in the, in the webinar. So uh, Jay, thanks for being with us. Let me just get us started with our first question. So your, your book is called Unwanted, and it refers to unwanted sexual behaviors. And uh, let's just start with that. How do you describe unwanted sexual behaviors? And why do they have so much power over us? Sure. Uh, Akshay, thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, so unwanted sexual behavior, I would just say, is any uh, dimension of your sexual life that at the end of the day you wish was not true. Uh, so that could be the use of pornography, extramarital affairs, buying sex, hookups. Uh, so, uh, you know, usually when we talk about uh, compulsive sexual behavior, oftentimes uh, people think about it in terms of what is a sexual addiction. And I, I, I think that sex addiction is one of those things that totally exists, but it's also overdiagnosed. And so part of what I wanted to do with this book is to say uh, all of us are sexual beings. Um, God has designed us as sexual beings and part of the maturity process is to not try and just quit our unwanted sexual behaviors, but to really begin to outgrow them. And so I think if we're honest, we all have fantasies that enter our minds when we're having sex. We all have sexual fantasies that have been with us from, let's just say, adolescence or early childhood. And oftentimes what ends up happening is we try to suppress those thoughts. We try to get accountability for those thoughts. Uh, in the US, we slap rubber bands around our wrist when we're having sexual thoughts. And so uh, what I hope that you see in that is that most of these approaches to address unwanted sexual behavior are primarily what I refer to as lust management. Um, and so, you know, when I was writing this book, one of my friends said to me, he said, Jay, when I've been having the same conversation with my accountability partner for 15 years, something isn't working. Uh, and so, you know, unwanted sexual behavior is just those dimensions of our sexual life that we want to get rid of, but don't necessarily know how. And to answer your question of why do they have such a strong grip on us, uh, I, I mean, I think we have to begin with the process of shame. Um, and shame is this really intense, painful feeling that something about me is unlovable, something about me is unwanted. 
And when we believe those messages about shame, we tend to isolate. We, we tend to hide our face and we don't let other people know about the struggles that we're facing. And so anytime there is shame, uh, there's going to be an increase in uh, compulsive behavior because you're feeling unwanted and you don't want to bring those behaviors to your community because you feel like you're going to be judged. And so you need relief from the shame, which is often where people begin to start their compulsive behavior all over again because it helps them feel immediately better, but in the long run, it intensifies their shame. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, even though shame is uh, universal, particularly in our culture, shame is is uh, front and center. So there's there's this common way of saying, Lo kya kahenge, you know, what will people say or what will people, what will people think? Uh, and it's even more so uh, in the church. So shame is is tremendously associated with uh, anything to do with sexuality in general. So could you talk to us a little bit more about uh, how how to overcome that? I mean, how do you deal with shame? Sure. Um, well, in my book, I, I talk about an example from uh, a, a guy named Andy Casagrande, who uh, he is a videographer, a cameraman for the show Shark Week. And uh, if you've never seen the show, essentially Andy gets into the waters with great white sharks uh, and he goes swimming with them without a cage. It, it's absolutely <laughs> um, uh, just crazy behavior that he's doing. Um, but what he what he does is he swims right at the direction of a great white shark. Um, and what he says happens is that when you're swimming in the direction of a great white shark, the shark comes up to the camera, bonks its nose against the camera, and then realizes that it's not food and then goes and swims away. And Andy Casagrande goes on to say this amazing phrase. He says, if you will not act like prey, they will not treat you like prey. And I think that has such an important message to us with regard to our shame that most of us try to swim away from the great white of shame. Um, but each time we swim away, all we're doing is legitimizing its messages about us, about how unlovable we are. But I think part of the point of healing is we need to turn towards our unwanted sexual behaviors. We need to turn towards our shame. And in turning towards our shame, we actually disempower the beast of shame. Uh, and I think that this is what we see something happening in the scriptures as well. Uh, you know, when the people of Israel are are dying, they, they're being eaten by these poisonous snakes. Uh, it, Moses kind of pleads to God on behalf of his people and says, please, like, do something. Our people are dying. And uh, God's remedy to the people of Israel is this. He says, Moses, I want you to take, you know, a bronze serpent, plop it up on a flagpole. And then when people look at this bronze serpent, they will be healed. So the allegory is pretty simple. When we look at the thing that's killing us, we will be saved. And so this picks up in the Gospel of John where uh, Jesus in, uh, or John chapter three, where John says, just as Moses lifted up the rod in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up in order for people to be saved. So it's always that sense of when we look at our shame, when we look at our violence, when we look at our heartache, uh, there's something about that that really disempowers shame and empowers us to be able to find healing in our lives. And so uh, that's that would be the primary encouragement is don't believe the messages that shame is telling about you turn towards them face them uh, and write a new story. Well, let's let's get into your book itself and you've structured yeah. your book around around three questions uh, and they're uh, how did I get here, uh, why do I stay. And how do I get out of here? So tell us about the, these questions and even just your approach to uh, unwanted sexual behaviors, because it seems quite counterintuitive and, and uncommon. I mean, you've described sexual fantasies as a roadmap. I mean, people want to look away from their sexual fantasies and deny them and suppress them, but you're actually inviting us to look at them and, and see them as a roadmap. So tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
let me start with a little bit of the research that grounds this book. So um, what I would say is most of the world is kind of stuck in a, either a very lust management framework or a shame management framework. So a lust management is what I described earlier. We're always trying to suppress our sexual life. We're trying to bounce our eyes. We're trying to get internet monitoring. We're trying to get accountability. And not that all of those things are wrong, but they don't actually attend to the heart of what's actually happening. Uh, in, uh, in the United States, a lot of the progressive circles, uh, I would say shame management is part of what we end up doing. So we say shame and stigma are the problem. And if we could just eliminate the shame and stigma associated with our sexual life, we would be free. Um, but that doesn't really work either. And so part of what I wanted to do in Unwanted was I asked about 4,000 men and women uh, to tell me their story, to get a sense of what were their relationships like with their moms and dads? What were you know, formative experiences like childhood sexual abuse, bullying? Um, and then I wanted to get a sense of what was going on in their present day life. Like, were they feeling a lot of shame in it? Uh, did they feel like they had a lack of purpose in their careers? Were they struggling uh, with depression? Um, and then I looked at, you know, to your point, Akshay, something that most people will never look at. I, uh, a lot of the major porn sites across the world actually keep track of all their data. And so uh, in the United States, we have the top 20 search for terms that we know. I'd be really curious what the top 20 search for terms are in India. Um, but what we learned was when we put all of that together. Uh, so in America, a lot of the mother genre, uh, step sister, um, maybe a, a certain race, uh, it, those sorts of things were really common sexual fantasies. So I basically asked people to describe all of those elements from their past, elements from their present, and then their sexual fantasies. And here's what we learned. We learned that sexual fantasies and sexual brokenness is not random at all. Uh, it is a direct reflection of the parts of our story that remained unaddressed. And so the implication that you spoke to earlier is huge. It means that our sexual fantasies and our compulsive sexual behavior is not a life sentence to sexual shame or addiction. It is a roadmap to healing. And this is really good news for us. And so that's why I structured um, the first question is, how did I get here? Second question is, why do I stay? And the third question, which is what everybody wants to know, which is, how do I get out? The problem is that so many people try and get out without understanding those first two questions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I can, and should I go in briefly just to some of yeah, yeah, why, go ahead, go ahead. How did I get here? Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that we learned was, uh, and this is taken from Dr. Patrick Carnes's research, is that a lot of people struggling with compulsive sexual behavior come from two types of families. One would be a very rigid family and one would be a very disengaged family. So a, rigidity, a rigid family system is where there's lots of rules, there's lots of regulations. Um, you know, if you if you do something that you're not supposed to do, you might get whipped, you might get hit, you might get a gaze from your mom and your dad that's really intended to kind of say like, you know, you, you should be ashamed of yourself for what you just did. Or a family uh, of disengagement. And disengagement is that sense of when you think back to your formative times in childhood, did you have a mother and a father uh, that were attuned to you. They read your face. So when you think about, at least for me, the hell of middle school, um, middle school was just such a prototype of hell. Um, when you came home from a really tough day of school, did you have parents that actually saw that something in your face had changed and that you were sad? Uh, and so what ends up happening for a lot of us is that if you grow up in a rigid family home with lots of rules and lots of regulations, you need a way to escape the tyranny of that rigid system. Um, and that becomes the function of pornography, that you might have, you know, a lot of people telling you what to do, but pornography gives you that initial experience of escape, that I can actually have my own power, I can have my own control, and no one knows about it. Or uh, a, a family like disengagement would be, 
I don't have anywhere to take my pain. I don't have anywhere to process my sorrow. And due to the ubiquity of the internet and the availability and affordability and accessibility of it, we take a lot of our pain and a lot of our sorrow and we learn that you know, orgasms. We learn that sexual material help us to feel a lot better about ourselves. And so rather than going to relationships, we learn to trust in something of pornography. The other uh, main thing that we learned was that uh, people who were the most significant users of pornography and the most significant pursuers of things like affairs and buying sex, uh, they had past histories of sexual abuse. And um, it, you know, we can talk more or less about it as we go, Akshay, but sexual abuse uh, happens on a spectrum. Um, it might be you know, a very horrendous, horrific rape or molestation that you experienced as a child, but it could also be the introduction of pornography. It could also be maybe an experience that you had with a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, um, a neighbor, boy or girl, that you would say was a little bit off or maybe a little bit awkward. And so what ends up happening is that for many of us, our first sexual template is pornography or our first sexual template is an abusive experience. And so what ends up happening to us is that we, we feel a level of bonding with someone. Uh, we, this is what's called as the grooming, the grooming process, where if you grow up in a very rigid or disengaged home, you're looking for someone to find you. And oftentimes an abuser almost has a sixth sense of being able to read a child and recognizing where they haven't been loved, where they haven't been pursued. And so those first initial experiences with an abuser are when they say like, you have a really beautiful voice uh, or it's really fun to play games with you. And so that first experience is, is life for you. But then as the grooming process goes on, you begin to experience sexual touch and in many cases, sexual arousal. And then in response to all of that, you feel shame. You feel like, how am I supposed to process this with anyone in my life? And so what ends up happening is your, your original sexual cocktail uh, is uh, oxytocin, which is bonding. You feel connected with someone, you feel pleasure, but then you also feel a lot of shame. Well, what ends up happening to us later in life is that we go and recreate some of those original sexual templates where we feel aroused, but we also feel deeply ashamed and we feel like we don't really know how to talk to anyone about what's going on. And so that, that's really the, you know, the first question, how did I get here, is this invitation to understand how some of your childhood wounds are operative today. Uh, the, the second question would be, why do I stay? And so, uh, you know, it, it's not just childhood wounds that keep us uh, anchored into our compulsive behaviors. It could also be the way that we live life. So one of the things that we found in the research was that people struggling with a lack of purpose in their life were seven times more likely to increase their involvement in porn. And so there you have that sense of if I feel like a failure or I, I feel like I don't have a job right now or I'm struggling with motivation and passion in my career, well, what ends up happening is that unwanted sexual behavior becomes so appealing because it gives you a place to be able to establish control. So if you think about, you know, just even the curse for a man and a woman in Genesis 3, uh, well, it's thorns and thistles. So that, that sense of by the sweat of my brow, I will work. But at the end of the day, everything is going to return back to dust. So someone's going to write a better book. Someone's going to have a better church. Someone's going to have uh, a more meaningful career than I am. And so how are we metabolizing the disappointments in our life? Well, if we're not processing them, unwanted sexual behavior becomes really appealing because we have this realm where we cannot fail and we get exactly what we want. And so I think that's the invitation for all of us is to be able to say, 
um, one of the reasons why unwanted sexual behavior can have such a firm grasp in our lives is because we don't know how to move through roadblocks and difficulties within ourselves without outsourcing the solution to something like pornography or an affair. So um, that would be the other thing. Uh, and then, it, you know, speak, I'll speak briefly just to um, sexual fantasies. So one of the things that we learned with regard to sexual fantasies is that they could be shaped and predicted based on the parts of our past story. So uh, one example that we found was that let's say that you were a man who was struggling uh, with a arousal template uh, or a sexual fantasy of wanting to see someone that was younger, maybe a college age student, uh, a race that suggested to you some level of subservience uh, or maybe a petite body type. What we found was that man had three primary factors that would drive that compulsive behavior. He had a strict father growing up. Uh, he had high levels of a lack of purpose in his life and he was dealing with high levels of shame. And so this is so important for us to get that if you grew up in a family that your father overpowered you, and you were feeling that lack of purpose that we just talked about, and you don't know kind of how to get your life going. Again, pornography becomes really appealing because it takes the pain. It takes the purposelessness and says, here's a world where all of your pain is gonna go away. Here's a world where for a moment, you're gonna feel strong and powerful. And uh, you know, a Franciscan priest in the United States says this, he says, uh, the pain that we do not transform, we transmit. Always someone else has to suffer because I don't know how to. And so I would say that's the invitation of the second question is where is there pain and purposelessness in your life? And how do you attend to that instead of using another human being for sexual gain in the midst of some of the difficulties of your life? And so all that to say, um, Sexual fantasies and sexual brokenness have so much to teach us about our life, about the roadblocks that we're facing, about past pain. And so rather than just trying to suppress your sexual life or being ashamed of it, be deeply, deeply, deeply curious about your sexual fantasies and about the road that got you to where you are today. Thanks so much, uh, Jay. Uh, let me just ask a little bit about uh, like the prime conditions for change. I mean, in, if it comes to when it comes to unwanted sexual behavior, what are the prime conditions for seeing change and and kind of experiencing increasing authority over our bodies and minds? Because I, I think mm -hmm. that's because uh, so in, in in India we're very pragmatic. So we want to know how, uh, <laughs> is it going to work and how long is it going to take. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so the first thing I would say is like you, you've got to be, you've got to start by being really curious. Uh, it, you, you have to understand that the keys to your freedom may be embedded within the sexual brokenness itself. And I will get really practical, but just that pivot between I want to get rid of my sexual behavior versus I want to be curious. So throughout the scriptures, right? When God shows up in trouble, what does God ask? Well, to Adam, who's just eaten of the fruit that he was commanded not to eat from, God shows up and says this, uh, where are you? He doesn't say bounce your eyes from that next tempting piece of fruit, get into accountability the next time that you wanna eat that apple or whatever the fruit was. Um, he says, where are you? He asks questions. And to Hagar, who's just been immensely traumatized by the first family of our faith, uh, the angel of the Lord finds her in the desert, finds her in the crisis, which is where God finds us, in the crisis, in the heartache of our lives, and asks her two of the best questions that any of us could ever ask in our accountability groups, which would be, uh, where do you come from and where are you going? And so just that sense of if you are hearing the voice of God uh, and it's not full of curiosity, if you're hearing the voice of God and it's full of accusation, part of what I would submit to you is that that is not the voice of God. God arrives with curiosity and kindness. This is what Romans 2.14 2, 
2.4 is getting at. Do you not know that it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance or leads to change? And so just that sense of be curious and kind towards your sexual life. So that would be the first thing is turn towards it with curiosity. Um, but as you know, as you spoke to at, at the beginning of this Zoom call, um, breaking isolation is just so important. Uh, part of what we found in my research was that about 59% of people struggling with compulsive sexual behavior did not feel like they had someone to talk to. Um, that's tragic. So just that sense of being able to get into a group uh, getting kind of doing what we're doing right now, hosting conversations where we are being curious, where we're talking about these things. So at least in the United States, uh, loneliness is the single greatest health factor facing American men, not heart disease, not lung cancer. Loneliness is the greatest killer of American men that's found medically. Um, and so I think that that is just immensely important that most of us, especially in, you know, COVID-19 era, we are, we are more isolated than ever. And so how do we break some of the isolation through connecting, through phone calls, through checking in with one another? Um, so that's, that's immensely important. Uh, the other category would just be what I refer to as a, a, the difference between a freedom from approach versus a freedom for. Um, most people, their hopes for recovery are far too small. Um, they try to get freedom from their compulsive behavior, but they never have a, a sense of what is the nature of what their freedom is for. Um, and so one of the, you know, I was working with a client uh, a couple of years ago, and he was saying, Jay, my backyard, uh, I, I want you to take a look at my metaphorical backyard. And he's like, look, there's no weeds, there's no sign of sexual brokenness anywhere. And I kind of joked with him and I said, yeah, but your, your whole entire life, your whole entire backyard is just full of barrenness. It's dust. There's nothing growing. And so what you've done is you've come in with your kind of gospel version of weed killer and tried to kill off all the weeds, but there's nothing there. And so what we began to work with was what does it mean for him to grow a beautiful garden? Um, to be able to invest in things that he actually cared about, to be able to pursue purpose in his life. And that's what freedom is all about. It's not trying to be free from our addictions and compulsions. It's being able to be free for the sake of life, for the sake of our family, for the sake of our integrity. And that's that point of addiction and compulsive behaviors are such a thief to us, they steal from us. And so when you begin to build this like really powerful sense of defiance of literally, hell no, I will not let pornography, I will not let evil steal from my joy, steal from my relationships, I'm going to stand against it. Uh, that's really when people's lives begin to change. So I would say we have to address the pain, but we also have to address where we, where we have a lot of power. Um, and then within that, I would say combined with that, groups are just really effective. Uh, so the ability to hear other men and women talk about their own abuse, to talk about their own compulsive sexual behavior, that begins to mitigate shame in our lives and really gets us a sense of, oh, these problems that I thought were only true of me um, are actually very common to all of us. Great, thank you, Jay. And I just want to ask yeah. a little bit, you mentioned in your book as well, uh, uh, what, what role does the enemy and the world self as, a, as, a, as, as the place in which we live, in which we dwell? And what, what, what kind of role do you think those two play apart from our own stories and our own flesh? And uh, what kind of role do they play in all of this? Yes, such a good question. Um, it, it plays a tremendous role. Um, and, it, you know, with, with regard to evil, what we learn in John 10.10 10 is that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
Um, and so, you know, evil is out to destroy the glory of God. It can't, um, but it goes after that which most reflects God's glory, which is us as image bearers, male and female, he created us. And so just that sense of when you begin to look at your sexual life, where has evil plotted to begin to bring something of destruction or shame to your sexual life? So God made our bodies. He made our penises. He made erections. He made the clitoris. Um, and so just that sense of like God gave us beautiful, amazing bodies to experience life, to give and to receive pleasure. And so where has evil worked to begin to steal, to begin to mar some of that heartache? And so um, it's just one of those things that we, we can't underestimate. Um, the, the work of evil to sabotage something of the greatest, uh, most beautiful portions of who we are. Um, when it comes to the world um, and society, I would say, yes, it, absolutely. Um, the, the reality that, it, you know, I can't remember all the stats, but um, it, it was something like the, the world a couple years ago watched 4.5 billion hours of pornography. I can't remember the exact stat, um, but the pornography industry is, they, they know that in the midst of the coronavirus, people are going to escalate their use of pornography. They know that at least in the US election cycle, that after the election is decided, porn use is going to skyrocket. They know that during our favorite pastimes, like football, baseball, whatever the big Super Bowl is in our country, they know that after those results are decided, people are going to use pornography. So just that sense of uh, our society is giving us something that the three A's of compulsive behavior are affordability, availability, and anonymity. So anything that allows me to be really anonymous, anything that allows me to get what I want really cheap and um, it's accessible to me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, well, that's going to really intensify my desire for whatever those behaviors are. So I think, you know, if, if we were to draw kind of the concentric circles, we would see, um, yes, my own story plays a role, evil plays a role, but also society. And we have to really begin to identify um, you know, this isn't a binary approach of we only address one or the other. This is something that we have to address all three of them if we're actually going to heal. So thanks so much. Jay. So I, I think in, in our context, I want to ask just a question about uh, what it takes to look at our family of origin and our past and what got us here, because I think sometimes even that is loaded with shame. And in your book, you've talked about this tension between honesty and honor. Uh, so could you could you speak into that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, very much so. Um, so one of the things that I love about scripture is that scripture uh, is incredibly honest, but at the same time, uh, it's incredibly full of honor. And so when you think about someone like uh, the patriarch of our faith, Abraham. Well, scripture is phenomenal in that we know that in Genesis 12, uh, Abram at the time left everything that he had in order to go into the land that God was calling him to go. So tremendous man of faith. At the same time, we also know that he trafficked his wife <laughs> twice. Um, we also know that he had sex with a teenage concubine because he was doubting the promises of God. And so that, that tension in scripture of, we're gonna honor this man of faith, but we're also going to be very honest about what, uh, what his shortcomings were. And so that's what I would say that most people are bent towards a type of honor for their families. Uh, they might say, you know, parents did the best that they could. If you think about their childhood or where they came from, um, you know, they, they, they're doing a great job compared to their parents. Um, but they really will not turn to face some of the heartache of their own life. And so just that sense of where has your father actually left you hungering for a father? Uh, where has your mother actually left you hungering for a mother? 
And so if we're honest, uh, we have all known something of sin within our family system. And I think this is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew 5, where he says, you know, every, every person on the planet struggles with lust. Everyone struggles with anger. And when we lust, what do we do? It, part of what Jesus is saying is yeah. that all of us are struggle with lust. All of us struggle with anger. That's not just sexual lust. That's, you know, I, I want my, my children to obey. I want my children to do well in academics. I want them to succeed. And whenever that desire becomes an ultimate thing, uh, uh, where there's a lot of desire and a lot of demand on a child, that has bordered into lust. But also kind of the nature of what we hear in James 4 is that what causes fights and quarrels among you or in your families? Well, you want something, but you don't get it, so you kill. And so again, scripture is saying, yeah, love and honor <laughs> your mother and your father, but you also have to step into James 4, which says when your parents didn't get what they want, uh, they were cruel. They were mean to you. And I think that's the invitation is, yes, let's honor our parents, but let's also be honest about some of the grief and heartache that they left in our life as well. Good. Uh, thanks so much, Jay. I'm going to ask just one last question before we can okay. uh, address some of the questions that are being asked mm -hmm. in, in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, yeah, when you think about uh, someone who's trapped in an unwanted sexual behavior and feeling ashamed and isolated, uh, what do you think Jesus wants them to know? Hmm. Hmm. This is such a good question. Um, I, mean, I think I think Jesus wants people to know kindness, and that that's that's that sense of it is the kindness of God that leads to change. Um, in in Matthew five four, it says, "Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted." And so. Uh, most of us, when we see our sin, when we see our sexual brokenness, we feel a lot of shame and self-contempt. Um, and that shame and self-contempt is actually part of our addiction cycle, that the more that we hate who we are and what we've done, the more that we're going to avoid people and pursue more behaviors that help us eliminate that feeling initially. And so I think part of what Jesus is inviting us into is this path of being kind to some of the heartache, some of the confusion in our life. And so, you know, whenever God is, shows up in people's lives, God shows up in exile, God shows up in slavery. Um, and it's not always to condemn people, but it's to get a sense of, you know, what's the nature of your identity? What's the nature of how you can find freedom? And so what I would say for most of us is that we have a lot of unprocessed pain and we have a lot of places that we do actually need to mature and grow up. Um, and sexual brokenness is just one of those maturity uh, human making machines. And I think that that's part of what Jesus would say is this is an opportunity to, to heal this is also an opportunity to grow. And so if we can sit at that confluence of, I'm, this is something that I'm gonna heal from, but this is also something that's gonna teach me how to grow. I think we're, it, we're gonna position ourselves in a very different place. So if I change the example away from sexual brokenness and let's just say a bad back, um, or it, you know, let's say my back is really hurting. Well, there's a couple ways that I could approach that. I could take, uh, you know, medication. I could uh, drink a lot of alcohol to not feel <laughs> my pain, uh, or I could let my pain be a teacher to me. And I could say, oh, maybe my back is trying to tell me about pain because I was in a car accident. Um, where I never really went to the doctor, but my pain is hurting right now. So that sense of our pain in our life, physical and also emotional, um, it is a teacher. It's trying to get our attention in the only way that it knows how. And so I think just that, that, that pivot from this is something that I'm gonna be condemned by to this is actually something that can teach me a lot about the path of healing. 
um, I think is the invitation for us. Great, thank you, Jay. And uh, I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of questions, but I, so I highly recommend that you read the book for yourself and, and get a copy. Uh, and it's available on Amazon India. So it's a great, it's a great book to buy and to discover for yourself. Uh, and Dan Allender described it as uh, uh, without rival, the, the best book on broken sexuality he's ever read. So, uh, and that's high praise coming from him. So uh, mm -hmm. I highly recommend you read the book and for all of you who are watching. Uh, and it'll give you much more than what we've just talked about. But let me move to the questions that are being asked. And if you have, if anyone has any more questions, please post them in the Q&A. And what you can even do, I think, is, is uh, uh, like or upvote a question if you, if you want that particular one answered. So I'm going to make it so that you can all see. Uh, I think you can now. All right, so let's let's start with uh, uh, this question. We do know that Jesus has taken our shame on the cross. Uh, However, we have been told that there are still consequences for sin, even when we are in Christ. Uh, but sexual sin, uh, but, uh, particularly sexual sin, sex before marriage, extramarital sex, etc., has the worst consequence, quote unquote, sinning against the body. Uh, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that, you know, when, it, when evil messes with sex, it has an annuity. Um, the return on investment that evil works off of sexual sin and shame. Because um, again, how long does it take for sexual abuse to occur? Uh, it could happen within 10 seconds. But that 10 seconds could go on to shape the trajectory of someone's life. And so I think, that, yeah, sexuality is such a powerful thing. And it, yeah, when you look at what breaks trust down in a marriage, um, the debris of sexual brokenness is often one of those things that has to be uh, addressed. And it's, it's really hard. It's really arduous work to begin to address some of that. So, I mean, to the point of that person's question, uh, you know, the cross does address so much of that. So when I think about unwanted sexual behavior um, and the cross, I think that they both are trying to get our attention. So what does Jesus say? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, what's the promise in so many unwanted sexual behaviors? Come unto me, <laughs> and I will give you rest and escape. The cross also addresses our anger. It, it addresses the places of heartache in our lives. God has taken sin and shame and nailed it to the cross. Well, what does unwanted sexual behavior also offer us? Well, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of the pain and the anger of your life, take that pain, take that anger to porn and begin to find someone else to use for your own sexual gain. So I think the cross is always this invitation to saying, who are you trusting? Because I think God and unwanted sexual behavior both both appeal to the deepest longings of the human heart, but only one really offers freedom. And so I think that sense of, yeah, we've got to take our shame. We've got to take uh, just the, the sins against our body and within our body uh, to the cross in order to find freedom. Thanks so much. Uh, let me move on to another one. Practically, what does it look like to move towards your shame? Uh, can you give a few examples? Uh, I think, the, I think uh, with reference to the great white shark and uh, sure. that analogy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the example that I use, we have a, an online course called the Journey Course. And this is a five month program for men and women and churches and accountability partners to reframe the conversation. So I didn't just want to critique uh, lust management and the church's just horrendous uh, response to sexual brokenness. I wanted to create a new path. And so the Journey Course, we, we use this uh, example of let's say that your sexual life is a house and so it's late in the evening and you hear that familiar knock of lust on your door uh, what are you going to do and so in the past you may have tried to put a force field around your house uh, and call you know someone for accountability or maybe you just let the intruder ransack various rooms of your house the approach that i'm inviting people into is what if you went out onto the front porch what if you met 
your lust, your shame out on the street. And you began to ask it questions. You said, why is it that this sexual fantasy has been with me since the time I was 14? Why is it that every Sunday evening I begin to feel a desire for porn like I don't normally feel during the week? Um, why is it that when I'm having sex with my spouse, someone else comes to mind? Why is that? And so when we begin to turn towards it and be curious and listen to our lust and do that in a community of other people that are also doing it, we're going to learn a lot of things. Um, and so I think just the practical step of shame is whether that's a, a friend to be able to say, here's some places of shame in my life. Here are some sexual fantasies that I don't fully understand. Uh, and help me to be curious about them. I think that's one of the practical steps that we take to um, defeat shame. So reading a book, uh, having a conversation with a mentor, uh, a therapist, those are all super practical and also highly valuable steps that we can take. Thanks so much. Uh, there's two questions here with relationship to uh, a partner. Uh, so the first one is, is, is it unrealistic? Is it an unrealistic hope to have a partner who doesn't struggle with these things, specifically with porn and masturbation? And the second one is, if your partner struggles with sexual sin, what are some things you can do to help? Uh, what are healthy boundaries to have to protect the feelings and the emotions of the partner who is not struggling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, I mean, with regard to partners, it, it's one of the most heartbreaking things. I mean, I, I think of it in terms of like a, a major automobile bus accident where once the damage, once the accident has taken place, there's a whole process of healing. So there's something called betrayal trauma. Um, and that's when you discover that your spouse has cheated on you. You realize that they've been looking at porn and have been keeping that really secretive from you. And so just that sense of what you're going to feel is a lot of pain. It's a lot of sorrow, a lot of anger. And so part of what I would say is you have to make a lot of space uh, for you to feel your emotions. Uh, don't try and stuff your emotions. So uh, we have something in our brain called Broca's area. And Broca's area is the region of speech. And so if you ever think about the death of a loved one, uh, something really traumatic, what you might say is, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say. I, I don't have words. Well, literally what's happening in your brains is that that Broca's area is going dark. Uh, you can't, it's not functioning. And so just that sense of, um, especially with, with spouses, uh, getting into a group to be able to process some of the betrayal, some of the pain is so, so important. Um, so we've got to attend to the betrayal trauma, but we also, after some healing begins to take place, we have to look at the patterns within a marriage that actually set some of these dynamics in place. Never ever to blame that a spouse is responsible for another spouse's behaviors, but many times these are uh, these are patterns in a marriage. So one example that I work with a lot in my own counseling practice is, let's say a man makes a, a bid to his wife for sex, she declines, and then he's up later on that night looking at pornography because he's feeling rejected and also really angry with his spouse. Well, part of where the fight is taking place is in pornography, rather than actually beginning to get a sense of how do we as a couple talk about intimacy so much better. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got to have a lot better conversations with our spouses. Uh, you know, to the question of boundaries. Yeah, boundaries are really important. Um, that that sense of being able to address that if these things happen again, that's going to have consequences with regard to our marriage. It's going to have consequences with regard to trust. So in some ways it is about a marriage, but it's also part of the breakdown of your spouse's integrity. So that's that razor's edge that you have to walk between this is something that it, it I don't need to believe the lies that I'm not good enough, I'm not attractive enough, kind of just some of those classic classic lies, that this is actually your partner's commitment uh, 
to not deal with reality, to escape reality, uh, to depend on unwanted sexual behaviors to get him through life. And so I think the more that we can get our perspective right with regard to this is an issue that our partner is facing, this isn't a reflection necessarily of my own inadequacy, uh, that, that's a really important step to take as well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Ravi, there's another question with regards to unwanted sexual behaviors and biblical teaching on it. So uh, in the context of unwanted sexual behaviors, how do we relate with uh, like Paul's teaching on gouging out the eye or cutting off the hand if it causes one to sin? I think that's a reference to the gospels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, part of part of that is, you know, the, the, if your eyes are causing you to sin, if your hand is causing you to sin, there's something hyperbolic where Jesus is saying, essentially, do anything that you can to address this. And I think that's, you know, I would say my approach is very consistent with that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, Romans twelve two says what? Do not be transform, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, you cannot transform your sexual mind if you don't actually know what's in there to begin with. And so uh, this is a very radical, I would say, approach is to understand your eyes, to understand your arousal, and to be deeply curious about it. So I think Jesus is saying, you know, don't be neutral, don't be passive, don't be, you know, just completely ashamed, take a radical step to address this. And so I think that that's part of a radical step that we can take is if, if my sexual fantasies are uh, affecting my marriage, if they're affecting my integrity, I need to take some radical steps here to begin to address it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. a, we have a, just a little bit of time left, so I just wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about the journey course, and you or you also sure. have something called the sexual behavior self-assessment. Uh, so tell yes. us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so two resources, um, so or three, I guess. So unwanted is the book. And then I, I developed something called the sexual behavior self-assessment. And that uh, was rooted in the research that I did. So it's about 160 questions. And uh, it's gonna ask you questions about your mom and your dad. It's gonna ask you formative experiences like abuse or bullying that you went through in childhood. But it's also gonna ask questions around depression, questions around anxiety, questions around uh, a lack of purpose in your life. And so uh, it's also going to ask with regard to kind of what your sexual fantasies are. So uh, it's, it's, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a difficult assessment to take. It's gonna take 20, 25 minutes, but it's gonna teach you a lot. And so after you take that self-assessment, you, you will receive a 40 page uh, report with regard to some of the key drivers in your unwanted sexual behavior. And so it will give you some compass headings with regard to how to find freedom, uh, what themes in your life are driving you to those behaviors, and then how to transform it. Uh, but we also have the journey course. And uh, if you get the journey course, the unwanted sex or the sexual behavior self assessment is included with it. It's part of the course package. Um, and the journey course is a five month program for men and women in churches to begin to outgrow unwanted sexual behavior. So I'm not big on the approach to just try and quit it, um, get rid of it, but I, I want people to understand their sexual life. And so uh, through about 18 episodes, it's gonna guide you into you know, your family of origin, some of the themes that were playing out uh, it's going to invite you to understand your own arousal template, the things that you sexually fantasize about, and then it's going to lead you into a journey of very practical steps with regard to how to find freedom from this. So it's a great thing that if you're kind of been in accountability for a long time or you've been in isolation for a long time, uh, it's going to help you identify some of those patterns. So. Uh, if you're looking for a group, we have group rates um, that you can look at as well if it's more than, you know, four people that want to go through it together. 
uh, but really just want to create resources to change the conversation on sexual brokenness uh, in our in our communities. So thank you so much, uh, Jay. Um, uh, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two questions more. So we've got a seven minutes left. So uh, here, here, here's a couple of others. Uh, uh, how much do I put up with, with when my husband exhibits unwanted sexual behaviors continuously? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, and it, it's one of those questions where uh, I don't think that you should put up with it. Mm -hmm. um, that there needs to be a way of kind of saying, if you're going to bring in trauma, if you're going to bring in the debris of sexual brokenness in our marriage, that's going to lead to types of consequences. So just that sense of how is that partner finding integrity? And so what integrity isn't just about not looking at porn or not pursuing an affair, it's the integrity to be able to say, there's some pain and there's some entitlement in my life that I need to address. Um, and so I think that all marriages are going to go through some type of crucible, oftentimes with regard to sexual brokenness. And so I think how a couple navigates these waters of being able to be really firm with, if you continue to bring this debris in, that's going to have a major effect on trust, on our sexual relationship. And so just that sense of how do you invite uh, your partner to begin to find their own healing work. And, and again, if they, if they want to continue a path of infidelity, they want to continue a path of uh, entitlement in their sexual lives, that's going to have a, a really big um, impact on their marriage. And so I think that's the, you know, in a, in a way, it's a two choice bind that your partner needs to enter. Either I continue my sexual brokenness and lead to a divorce or I actually begin to address my own pain and heal our marriage. And uh, I've got, I'm, I'm going to ask the last question just for, uh, to possibly end with some, uh, uh, so some success stories. So I, I, from, <laughs> uh, from your yeah. perspective as a, as a counselor and, and have you seen clients experience the victory that they desire and what does that look like? Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad we're ending on that note too. Um, yes, I see it all the time. Um, and that that's part of just the beautiful process of getting to do this work is that it, you see something of miracles take place where people thought that, you know, I would never be able to find freedom in my marriage, or I would never be able to address this issue. And yet people do. So uh, one of my clients that I talk about in the book, um, he came to see me. I was a sex therapist in the city of Seattle for a long time. Uh, now in uh, New York City, if you've heard construction, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> There's construction going on right outside my apartment. But um, when I was in Seattle, uh, I worked with something called the John School. And so this was a program for men who had been arrested for soliciting women in prostitution. And when I started working with some of these men, uh, one guy, I'll call him Jonathan, came in and he said, Jay, don't get me wrong. Like I, I buy sex because it feels good and I also feel powerful. But he said, the thing that I care about the most uh, is cruising around the streets of Seattle, trying to lock eyes with women on the streets. Uh, and I said, that's really interesting. You cruise around the streets of Seattle trying to lock eyes. And so some of the questions that I normally ask clients in the first few sessions is to kind of tell me some of the formative experiences of their life and kind of some of the earliest memories. And he told me a couple memories. He said his first memory was having chicken pox and he was in his crib and he was crying and trying to reach out for his mom or his dad, but no one came. And so just that first experience of uh, isolation, first experience of I'm crying out, but no one's coming. And then he also had a memory of uh, having, he was sick and 
he had a nanny that was with him, but he remembered seeing his mom and his dad kind of reverse out of the driveway and head to work. And he was crying, pleading with them to come back. So just this man um, as a boy had a lot of heartache, a lot of disengagement in his life. Um, but then he said, Jay, I got this new bicycle when I was 13 years old. And he said, I loved that bike. And I said, tell me a little bit about your, why you loved it. And he said, I used to cruise around the streets of my neighborhood, just trying to lock eyes with girls in my class and my friend's moms. And so unbeknownst to him, what he was saying was that this ritual of getting out, of locking eyes with women, of girls, was something that started in a very innocent way for him as a child, and then eventually grew into a very compulsive behavior that did a lot of damage and violence against women. And so for him, it wasn't about stopping. It wasn't about getting into recovery. It was about connecting with that boy uh, who had been very alone and had learned to cruise around in order to find people. And so for him, the healing path wasn't uh, just trying to white knuckle his approach to healing. It was about being able to say, there is a boy within me that I need to be kind, I need to find. And so rather than outsourcing that site to a spouse, outsourcing that site to a pastor, outsourcing that site to pornography or buying sex, he said, I want to be the man who brings comfort and rest to that boy. And I would say that that's such a, a good window into what healing is really like, is that I'm gonna attend to my pain but I'm also going to have integrity with my story in order to know that I'm the person uh, that I, I need to find rather than finding someone else. And so uh, I have seen that happen. Uh, another story with regard to a, a woman that I was working with who had uh, just a series of affairs. Um, part of what she learned in this process is that in her marriage, she was not really engaging her desire. She, uh, you know, I don't know if the Enneagram is popular in India <laughs> right now, but in the United States, uh, there's a test that you can take called an Enneagram. And so this would be a classic helper type in the Enneagram. And she uh, <clears throat> would always suppress what she really wanted in her life. Uh, she loved her kids well, she loved her, her husband well, and that was kind of from the <clears throat> from the exterior world. She was trying to commit uh, to just serving other people, but she had this her own desires that she was never attending to, never speaking to, and so affairs became the place where some of the secrecy of her desires played out. And so in the process of getting into therapy, addressing the wounds in her marriage, she began to see that the only place that she's really honest about what she wants is in sexual fantasy, not in reality. And so she allowed her sexual brokenness to actually be a teacher to her about how does she address the things that she wants and fights in her marriage rather than hiding within it. And so I think that just that sense of how do you allow sexual brokenness to be a crucible of growth and healing uh, will we'll, we'll let you heal so much more than just praying um, to God to heal you and just kind of this very naive hope that one day, one new year, you're just going to wake up and not desire it anymore. That That's not an effective path. <laughs> so. Great. Thank you so much, Jay, for being with us. Thanks so much for uh, all your work and all your research and, and, and the book. Uh, and uh, that's all the time we have uh, this evening. But I want to remind you just of those three resources. There's the book Unwanted Itself, and then there's the Journey course, and uh, also the uh, Sexual Behavior Self-Assessment. Uh, it's in your chat, and I hope you're able to uh, follow up with Jay in his book. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us this evening. And thank, thank you so much, Jay, for being with us. I think it's been a oh my God. Thank you for having me. It's been, it's been so fun to be with you, Akshay, and your yeah. community. So thank you for this honor of being invited to do this. Thanks so much. I hope one day we are able to see you face to face in India. I know. Me too. That would be yeah. so good. Truly. All right.
Thank you all. Thank you for joining us and uh, goodbye. Have a nice night.